All right, praise the Lord. Last week or two weeks now, we started a series. The Lord wanted us to share from the book of Revelation. And we're talking about entering the city of God. So this is the second part, entering the city of God. Our, our main text is actually Revelation. Remember, chapter uh, 21. That's where our main text is coming from. And there John was saying he saw the holy city descending out of heaven, you know, a door for a husband as a bride. And then he talks about the gates. Uh, I tried to make you understand that a city of God, or the city of God have nothing to do with a geographical thing. It's not something that you are going to go to enter into some days when you die or when you are raptured to heaven. What about this? God's city is not upstairs. Hallelujah. Are you with me? God's city is not upstairs. God's city is not something you go to when you die. The city of God, it is the city that Abraham was looking for. Anyway, we'll just read the scripture. Hebrew chapter 11, verse number 9. This is the city that Abraham was looking for. And uh, Abraham was looking for it because at the time Abraham was looking for this city, it has not yet come into existence. Amen? So Hebrew 9, the Bible says, By faith, that is Abraham, sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, with Isaac and, and, and Jacob, the heirs with him, of the same promise. The next verse says, For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Amen? Hallelujah. He was looking for a city will build our maker is God. Now, in the true sense of it, it is like saying, because if you check the original Hebrew word there, I mean Greek word, it signifies it's like the governor of a people, you know, one who forms them by instructions and institutions of laws, you know, the framer of political considerations. What I mean now is, Bringing the people together and giving a specific instruction. That's what it means to be whose maker is God. What he's trying to say is, God called the people together, gave them the laws, gave them the spirit to walk in the laws that is given to them, that he be their director, he be their... I mean, it's just like a government. But in the, in the city put together, this time, I want you all to understand again, I made you to understand before, that a city... It's simply many houses put together. I don't know if you understand that. Good. A city is different from Hamlet because a city has many other houses put together in a particular setting. So you call it a city. And so we know that the church is the city of God and the houses in the city is you and I. You and I put together and makes up what? The city of God. Now, Abraham was looking for the city because the foundation is actually in Christ. It was not in existence when he was living. So he was looking for that city. Praise the Lord. Amen. Whose maker is God. So we're talking about the heavenly father instituting a heavenly um, institution. Okay, let me give you something here. Philippians 3 verse 21. Or would it 20 alone? Philippians 3.20. That would be okay. Philippians 3.20. Uh, it says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our conversation. Give it to me from the Amplified Translation. Or any other one. Maybe the Message Translation, whatever. Okay, it says, But we are citizens of the state. That's what conversation means. Conversation is not one talking to the other. It's not gossip. Is that okay? But we are citizens of the state, the common way, the homeland, which is in heaven. To be in heaven doesn't mean which is up in heaven. You know, that's not what it said. Which is in heaven. Now, this is what you understand. The word in has to be the end. The Greek, get it right. He that is in Christ is what? A new creature. You don't have to be up in the sky to be in Christ. Did you get that? So, the city is in heaven, means our existence is what? Heavenly. That's what he's saying. He's not saying you have to go to heaven to be in the city. 
how to be a citizen of that city. Right now, you are a citizen of, of where? Of heaven. And there's the city that Abraham was looking for. He said, come on, wait. Praise the Lord. And from him also, we earnestly and patiently await the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our Savior. Savior of what? To come and save us? You already saved. Am I right? Come on. Are you there with me? You already saved me. So, what is he coming to do? Look at the next verse, the 21. This is what he's coming to save you from. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things, what? Unto himself. This is the salvation. Salvation of your body. That's what he's coming to do. And listen, he is within this city that we are in, which is the heavenly city. So when we say we are citizens of heaven or the common work which is in heaven, we are not saying you've got to go upstairs to be in that city. Because if that, that's the case, that means you have to go upstairs to be in Christ. Is it correct? Because he that is in Christ is a new creature. So if you must travel to be in, I mean, to be in heaven, in this context, then you must also travel to be in Christ. But to be in is to have your existence in a realm. We are dealing with spiritual realities. And that is why the Bible made you understand the book of Acts. Say, in him, how many of you understand that? In him we live and move and have our being. In who? In God, who is spirit. Now, until you come to this, you can get the benefit of your new bed. Until you come to this, the truth is, we don't understand what the new birth of Christ is. Help me. John 3, verse 3. No, John 1, let's look at verse 12 and 13. Take it from the Amplified. We don't understand what the new bed really is. We don't. Look at that. But as many as he received and welcomed him, Jesus now, he gave the authority, the power, privilege, right to become the children of God. That is to those who believe and adhere and trust in and rely on his name. Now look at the next thing. Who own their bed, neither to blood, nor to the will of the flesh, that of physical impulse, nor to the will of man, that of a natural father, glory, but to God, they are born of God. Who is God? God is spirit. Are you following what I'm talking about? So there is a natural birth. There's what? A spiritual birth. And if you are born into a family, you belong to a family and that family belongs to a particular location and that is where your identity is. So now, if God is spirit and get back to you and God is in heaven, where are you supposed to be? There's a problem. <laughs> Jesus will say, I am the vine, you are what? The branches. Have you read that in your Bible? How can the branch be outside of the place where the vine is? Now, when I say this, people, people get confused. They say, this man doesn't believe in heaven. I believe more in heaven than everybody else. If I is the church that doesn't believe in heaven. But we do. This is a plant. This is supposed to be a branch. If the, if, if the branch is in the plant, the branch must be where the plant is. Am I correct? We don't have understanding. That's why we are unable to live out the potentials that God has given to us as sons of God. So I'm dealing with the city that Abraham was looking for. A heavenly Jerusalem where he gave birth to his own sons to walk on the face of the earth. As at that time, it has not come into existence. Can I hear an amen? All right. So I just want you to move on with me. Revelation again, let's look at that. Revelation 21 verse 12. Let me try to concentrate on one and a half for you. We're dealing with one gate today. It's going to be the gate of Reuben. Now, the Bible says, verse 12, The city had a wall, great and high, and had twelve gates, 
and had the twelve gates to have angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the tribes of the tribe of children of Israel. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. Now, you watch this. It's talking about a city that have walls so high. And then, within these walls were 12 gates. East, north, west, south. Three, three gates each. Is that okay? And all these gates were named after the children of Israel. The 12 tribe, to be specific, of Israel. Now, you know you need a gate to enter a city. Are you with me? Very good. If you're coming here now, this is a gate, this is an entrance. You need a gate to enter into the city. Don't forget, we're talking about entering the city of God. So, here we found that this city has 12 gates, and these 12 gates are named after the 12 sons of Jacob. Meaning, if you must enter into the city, you're going to pass through one of these gates. That is to say, you must come to be able to become one with the characteristics of that particular gate to be able to enter the city. Is that alright? So, Ezekiel 48 with me in verse 31. Ezekiel 48, 31. And this is what it says. And the gates of the city shall be after the names of the tribes of Israel. Three gates northward, one gate of Reuben, one gate of Judah, one gate of Levi. We're going to start with the gate of Reuben. Hmm? And then we move down to now. now remember, these are the, the children of Leah, which he gave back to for Jacob. Is that okay? You know Leah? Rachel, Leah? Amen? Okay. So here we go. We want to look at the gate of Reuben. So we know that Reuben is a gate. Who is Reuben? That's the first question. Now, the word Reuben actually means the spirit. How do I put this now? It actually, when you look at the word Reuben, it means one thing. Behold, a son. Hmm? Come on, are you with me? Behold. When Leah gave birth to Reuben, you know, because there was this issue that was going on. Jacob loved the sister more than Leah, and on and on. And so now, Leah was the first to give birth. And he brought for his son, and he called his name Reuben. What does that mean? Reuben means, behold, his son. Hallelujah. Amen? So he was the eldest son of Jacob and Leah. As a matter of fact, he was the first band of Jacob. Praise the Lord. So what is the spirit or what is the gate of Reuben? The gate of Reuben stands for sonship. You've got to be a son to be able to enter into the city of God. As it were. You must possess the spirit of sonship. Now I want to show you something. Remember, Except the man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Is that okay? Very good. So you're born to enter. You're born as a child to enter. But then we're also talking about maturing in your sonship. Is that all right? Because this is just not an ordinary son. It's going to be a mature son. Behold, his son. Praise the living God. Are you following me? So that's the gate. So in your walk as a believer, in your walk as a Christian, you must come to the place of reality. Anyway, let me just move on. I'm going to show you some stuff. Okay, here we go. Now, let me look at Amplified Translation, Galatians chapter 1, verse, I mean 4, and verse number 1. Praise the Lord. Now, what I mean is that as long as the inheritor, the heir, is a child, and under age, 
he does not differ from a slave, although he is the master of all the estates. One thing you need to understand, help me, Father. One thing you need to begin to understand, begin to understand, as a matter of fact, is you have to be a son to become an heir, to be able to inherit what your father has. You cannot be in the church and walk like a slave continuously. Then you have not entered into the city of the living God. The mentality of a slave must be taken away from you. You must come to the place of maturity in your thinking, in your understanding of who God is to know that you are actually an heir of God. Now, let's just read on a little bit. Verse 2. And he says, verse 2. But it's under guidance and administrators or trustees until the date fixed by his father. Verse number 3. And he says, So we, Jewish Christians, also... When we were minors, we were kept like slaves under the rules of the Hebrew ritual and subject to the elementary teachings of a system of external observation and regulations. Verse 4. But when the proper time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, Born subject to the regulations of the law to purchase the freedom of to ransom, to redeem, to atone for those who were subject to the law that we might be adopted and have sonship conferred upon us as being recognized as God's sons. Verse number six. And because you really are his sons god has sent the holy spirit of his son into our hearts crying what our father therefore you are no longer a slave born servant but a son and if a son then it follows that you are an heir by the aid of God through who? Through Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. I want you to understand that. Now, I have always said this. I believe in favor. But truth is, you can favor somebody who is not your relation. The man you favor in the street cannot inherit your properties. I mean, if you understand what I'm saying. You bless beggars on the road sometimes, do you? Can the beggars be included in your will when you're writing the will? No. Now, it is only the will that reveals what the Father has given to each and every one of us in relation to that of uh, inheritance. Therefore, you find that as much as you talk about grace in relation to favor, I believe more in inheritance. Because if God favors you and you have no relationship with him, you can inherit anything. You struggle to do stuff. But if you come to the place of inheritance as a son, things come to you. Just as written there by the father. You step into your portion on a daily basis as God has apportioned to you from his will. Because you are a son. Praise the Lord. That is different from being a slave. A slave, as a matter of fact, does not inherit anything. So your relationship with God is so vitally important that you come to the place in God where things literally comes to you without you struggling for them because you are a son. If you look at Genesis 25, you'll be able to see the picture there clearly. You know, Keturah was a concubine wife to Abraham and several other children. By the time come, the Bible made us understand that Abraham sent all the concubine children away and gave them gifts so that Isaac, his son, might inherit. Concubine children does not share inheritance with the sons in the house. Hallelujah. Are you following me? 
Now the Bible is saying he has redeemed us just like the Jews were under the rituals of the world. Even the Gentiles also were under specific, I mean, definite rituals, if, you, if I may use the word, of different idols and traditions and customs. I mean, if you understand what I'm saying. We had all manner of gods we were worshipping that we believe in that they were directing our lives but all of these things were just nothing but elementary principles to guide us even into Christ until we find reality so many of you, so many of you are still living by traditions by customs but you must understand that you have another spirit at work in your life until you identify with this spirit come to think about it when you say Abba Father what you are trying to say is God is my father if God is your father you will meet your need. How many times have you gone to God because you have a need? That's the problem. You know what we do? We rely more on people. We rely more on, on family members. We rely more on friends. We rely more on, you know, and sometimes people make promises to you and they don't feel those promises. They don't fulfill it. If you are a son, how many times have you gone to your father because you have a need? You have not seen God as your father yet. You have not had that relationship as your father yet. You're just living. You're just going to church. You just, you know, you pray corporately with people when you pray. But individually, he gave us the spirit of his son, whereby we cry what? Abba, Father. Go back to Romans chapter 8 with me. Romans 8, verse 14. King James. And this to me is very important. Romans 8, verse 14. For as many as are led... By the Spirit of God, they are what? The sons of God. The next verse. Verse 15 says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby you cry what? Abba Father. <laughs> the Spirit has bear a witness with our spirit that we are what? The children of God. And this is also very, very crucial. The Spirit bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. But let me first say this. He gave all the spirit, and then the Bible says we are adopted. There are two ways you look at this. The first instance is in the Western culture, the Greek culture. If you go to an orphanage, home, right, and take a child, you have adopted that child. It begins to bear your name. Is that okay? Now, the way it is operated is this. Even if after you've taken the child, you give birth to a child, the law stipulates that that child that you adopted will bear equal right with your own child. It's as serious as that. Are you following what I'm talking about? So now, think about it this way. Because people often talk about it, and sometimes I remember sharing with somebody, one bishop in South Africa, adoption in this context is so strong i want you to understand this you share equal rights with whoever is born into that family as long as you have been adopted because you lose your identity and take on the identity of the one that have adopted you so if god have adopted us as gentiles for instance it simply means we've lost our identity we lost everything about our old life and now we bear the image, the name, the nature of the one that have adopted us. Because if you were to write a name, for instance, in a document, you could write David God. Did you follow what I've just done here? My name is David. If I'm adopted by God, my son name becomes who? God. And anytime you have a name which has to do with your son name, it describes your true genetic traits which has to do with your family i'm writing something i'm here to post it on people don't even understand yet that the truth is the blood in you right now is not your father's blood it's your father's blood <laughs> praise god somebody got that you follow what i'm saying now it's not your biological blood because you've been born again and there is no way you can be born without blood being infused into your life so when people teach you you are suffering from your parental causes they are wasting your time 
You are just being fooled. If I am making you to lose your identity, which is your true identity, and that is God. The blood in you is the blood of God. Do you understand that? Praise the Lord. I want you to get this. That's why you read, when you read Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, what is he telling you? It talks about the word of God, as chapter 8, 2, just saw it. Huh? Divine spirit, soul, and body, and then talks about going down, deep down to what? To the marrow. What is in the marrow? Biologically speaking, we know that in the marrow, that's where blood is formed. Why is the word of God going into your marrow? To change your blood. It's an operation that is taking place. So, if you're suffering from sickle cell anemia, what happens? They drain your blood and infuse another blood. The blood of Adam is sickle cell anemia. Praise God. So the word of God is going into your system to change your blood. So you don't have the blood of Adam, neither do you have the blood of your father that died a few years ago. Therefore, there is nothing in the blood of your family that can pursue you. Because you don't have it. I'm talking about the gate of Reuben. Becoming a son in the house of God. When you come to this realization, nothing shakes you. Because you know where you belong to. That's how to enter into this city. You see? So many people are in this city today who don't know their right and their suffering. You can also even pretentiously enter into the city without knowing who you are and what happened. You'll be suffering what other people are suffering. So being in church is not the, I mean, it's not the answer. You've got to be in the city and you have to do that, spiritually speaking. You've got to know who you are. Ruben, which is a false bond. How many of you understand that every false, every false bond has a double portion? What is that supposed to mean? So if you enter as a false born, if you enter into the city of God as a false born son, through Reuben, you are qualified for double portion. You don't need to go for a program for double portion. The only thing that enables you to have a double portion is to enter realizing that you are the Reuben in the city. Every false born is qualified for a double portion. You follow what I'm talking about? That means, I know what double portion really stands for. Double portion is not having two things. Double portion simply means... The first man will have a portion to take care of his family and have a portion to take care of the extended family. That's why he's given a double portion. So if I have a first man in my family, I could take care of my immediate family and take care of my extended family. That's what double portion means. And what that really means is God wants to prosper you beyond measure. Because if you are not as prosperous as that, how can you take care of your family and take care of the extended family? But double portion qualifies you to be prosperous. That means when you enter into the city, realizing that you carry the spirit of Reuben, which has to do with the spirit of sonship, you are qualified for a double portion. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? Praise the Lord. So, he has given all the spirit of his son, whoever will cry what? Abba Father. Another way you find in the Hebrew culture of adoption is this. If your child is in the house and grows to a place of maturity who can handle your properties and handle, maybe manage your estate, you bring him out to the open and you tell the elders and speak to the people, from today, this my son can sign my signature to manage my estate. What you've just done is what is called what? An adoption. And that is why you find that Jesus Christ, when the scripture says, this my beloved son, whom I well please, three times he said that. He was adopted three times. One, into the prophetic office. Two, into the priestly office. Three, into the kingly office. And so, when he said, This my beloved son, whom I will please hear him, what he meant to say is, Let every creature hear what this man have to say. Because right from today, he can sign my signature. That is why when he spoke to the wind, the wind had to obey. Because when God said, This my beloved son, even the wind they heard. That's why it was not I mean, difficult for the devil to get out because God said, hear, hear him. He was given the signature of authority to sign on behalf of God. That is sonship. Amen? I was in Bonnie, we were talking and somebody asked me, I was ministering to the intercessor and a question came up. What is prayer in the true sense? 
You see, you mature to a place in God that your words carries power with it, even without you shouting. Do you understand it? Now, I believe when we come to church, we can pray corporately, but individually, sometimes when you speak... Now, I'm going to give you an example of that. The gate of Reuben is so extensive, but let me give you an example of this. Go to Hebrews. No, Romans 11. Let's look at Romans 11. Let me see Romans 11. That's what I want. Romans chapter 11. Very quickly. I say that has God cast away his people, God forbid. For I am also an Israelite, Paul speaking, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Ned verse says, very quick, God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What you know what the scripture said of Elias? How he make intercession to God against Israel, saying, Next verse. Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thy altars, and I'm left alone, and they seek my life. Next verse. But what's the other answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of who? Of bad. But now I want you to look at the verse 2. The key point is verse 2. What did he say in verse 2? Look at it. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. We are not what the scripture said of Elias, how he made what? Intercession to God against Israel. Doing what? Saying, not shouting, saying. And what he said, God recorded it as what? Intercession. <laughs> now, you, you watch this. That's why I've always spoken to intercessors. It's not everything you pray about that God answers because you are not intercessor. Even when some people said, I'm going to fast seven days for you to die, they are wasting time. Those fasting is just starvation. You know why I said that? Here is Elijah who will say, the, I mean, there will be no rain. You understand that? For three years, and then when he say rain, rain comes. He can stop anything, can cause fire to come down from heaven. He prayed a prayer, God did not answer it. Huh? Are you with me? Praise the Lord. Because it's not according to the will of God. But what I'm trying to show you here is the word sin. That means, come on, help me. You grow to a place in God, you don't just utter words. Because your words are powerful. Your words become strong. Jesus wasn't just speaking carelessly. How I many of you understand that? You have to know what I'm saying and come to that. I'm talking of entering the city as a Reuben, the spirit of sonship. You must mature to the point that whatever you say comes to pass. It's not how long you're going to say it. It is just saying it because what you are saying carries power. The authority of God is there because we are his son in the house. Praise the Lord. Did you picture what happened to Samuel's mother and Eli? Samuel's mother and Eli. Very good. Samuel's mother and I went there praying and crying and all of that. And Eli said, touch. She was drunk and said, no, I'm not drunk. Okay, if you're not drunk, what do you want? I want the baby. Go and have your child. How long did Eli spend praying for Hannah? Talk to me. Go and have your child. And that was someone. Power, follow the word. You see, those who are truly strong in the spirit, they don't utter words. And they don't get angry too quickly. Because in your anger, the things you say will manifest. So men in authority with power spiritually, they don't get angry too quickly. So one of the signs that you are not maturing in God is anger. But I'm talking of entering the city. Is anybody getting what I'm talking about? It's anger. When you are easily provoked, when you flare up so quickly, it shows you are not maturing. It shows you have not started possessing the spirit that I'm talking about. I'm going to show you a few things. Hallelujah. So, it talks about we've been delivered from the spirit of bondage, like we are in the book of Romans. Is that okay? I mean, Romans 8 now. Praise the Lord. 
And he talks about the spirit bearing witness with our spirit. Now, the only way God can convince you is to speak to your spirit man. You should be able to know if you are truly born again. You should be able to know if you have come to this understanding that I'm talking about. You should be able to know that. Because heaven bear witness with your spirit that they are truly my son. I mean, I want you to get that. Praise the Lord. Go back to Romans on the, on, on the board. I mean, Romans chapter... We're Romans chapter 8. Praise the Lord. And verse 16. We're crying about Father. And the Bible says, God bearing witness with our spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse number 16. The spirit is a bearing witness with our spirit that we are what? The children of God. God is spirit. So you are not going to look for material things to really determine how much of your sonship is. No. The witness has to be in your spirit. And God is speaking to your spirit. Because you are born in and through your spirit. Your spirit relates to God. Your spirit came from God. And your spirit goes back to God. In the true sense, it's your spirit that is born again. Walking in a physical body. Hmm? Let me show you something. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse number 7. Praise God. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse number 7. Look at what it says. Then shall the dust return to the dust. That's when a man dies. And what happened? As it was. And what? The spirit returned to God or shall return unto God who do what? Who gave it. Spirits don't die. That is your true essence with God. What is he saying? When the spirit came and become part of dust, man became a living soul. When you drop the flesh, your spirit goes back to God from where you came. That means you came from God. You have to return to God. And that is why, you see, when Jesus prayed, he simply said, into thy hand I commend my spirit. That's all. He didn't commend his body, his spirit. And that is why, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Your human spirit, which is the candle of the Lord. For about 20, 27. Are you following me? So when your spirit is truly born again, God bear witness with your spirit. If you walk in the road, you should be able to know convincingly, I'm a child of God. You have to come to that understanding. You must overcome the spirit of bondage and acting like a slave if you must enter the city with the true spirit of sonship. Praise the living God. Are you with me? So, let me take this again. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 15. Very important. Hebrews 2 15. Talking about Jesus. And he says, And deliver them, that is became part of us. Deliver them through fear of death. Where all their lifetime subject to bondage. And for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. And that is what? the devil. Jesus became like you because of you. Is that okay? That you are living in this realm and you live in continuous spirit of bondage, of fear. They want to kill me tomorrow. The witches are after me. The wizards are after me. People in my family are after me. He said, this is continuously the way you live. So he said, okay, I want to show you that you can live in the flesh and still live like a son of God. So he put on flesh and he lived out his life here on the earth without this spirit of fear or intimidation of anybody. There comes a time they wanted to kill him because he said, I'm, I'm a father when so you're making yourself a son of God took him to a cliff of the mountain wanted to push him down. The Bible says he walked between them. They couldn't see him. Sonship in manifestation. Hmm? Now you can't preach that in church today. Preach that in church. They say, no, that's mysticism. That's occultism. They forgot that the occult people picked what was Christ and they are using it. Because the devil have no originality. It's only a copycat. Hmm? Praise the Lord. I've told us here sometime, I have stories of people from the eastern side of this country, Calabar area, I don't know, maybe you can testify to that. They can just rest their body on your door and they're going inside. Am I correct? You've heard a story? Where did they get that power from? 
Now teach that in church. They say, no, that is the devil. Now if the devil can do it, why can't a child of God do it in the true spirit? So you see, Christianity has been reduced to nothing but no religion. We've lost power. We've lost authority. We don't have it anymore. We're just living just like ordinary people. And Jesus came to demonstrate to us that life is much more than the way we're living. He only came to show us what sonship is. That you may live from there. If some man who doesn't know God can rest their body on the wall or I mean on, on the door and they move in. Jesus demonstrated that. The disciples were all afraid. They locked themselves up there because they felt they are going to be persecuted at whatever. The Bible said Jesus went through and began to talk to them. And they thought he was a ghost. He said, I'm not a ghost. If you want to check me up, look at my fingerprint, check my side. I am the one that rose from the grave. How did they go in? That's what we're talking about. Are you there with me? How many of you can attempt that? Practically impossible. That's what I'm telling you. Tell you how low you are. Huh? I'm talking about sonship. The gates into the city. <laughs> Amen? Praise the Lord. I mean, think about that. Have you ever seen one? I mean, have you heard all these people talking about mighty men of God, mighty men, mighty men? I have no problem with all that. They are as mighty as they are. But can anybody demonstrate true sonship to us? Huh? We all need to press in <laughs> through the spirit of Reuben. Praise the living God. So bondages are companies, religiosity that cannot bring man to perfection. Just as the Jews were full of rituals, the church is full of rituals today. Nothing to show for it. Tradition. Rituals. How many of you understand? There was a group of ministry, I mean, of believers sometimes, they called them the Quakers. Quaker was not truly their name, but what happened was, they come to church, and they just sit down. Everybody sits down. And they begin to wait for the Holy Spirit. No noise, no music, nothing. They begin to wait for the Holy Spirit. They are meditating the coming of the Holy Spirit upon them. And before you know it, they begin to shake. Everybody begin to vibrate. People start speaking in tongues. No drums, no praying, nothing. And because of the way they used to shake, that's why they were called Quakers. They were experiencing God's presence. Because they have an understanding of how to relate with the Holy Spirit. You come to church, you are praying, you are so dry. So dry. No contact, no connection. You came the way you, I mean, you go back exactly the way you came. With your face down. No joy, even after service. Because no contact with spirit. You have not entered. You have not even seen the spirit of sonship. Praise the living God. Is anybody following what I'm sharing this morning? I want you to grow. You have to enter this city. With a new understanding that you are a son of God. Hallelujah. Come on, are you following what I'm saying? Jesus made a statement. Say, look, it's like saying, Death has no power over me. I can lay down this body and take it up again. Have you read in the Bible? Very good. So, what does that mean? He took up his body in the grave. He did. I can lay it down and take it up again. Destroyed in table in three days and I will raise it up. Think about that. He said, what power has God given unto me? Why? Because his son. He said, about time you speak to your bodies. Are you hearing me? It's about time we get challenged about the things around us and make some pronouncement about our physical bodies. We can. He said, destroy this temple in three days and I will raise it up. And exactly three days he picked up his body from the grave, walked out of the grave. People thought it was a ghost, but he picked up this body. That is sonship. Hmm? It's sonship. I'm talking about sonship. I want you to come to that place, entering the city, knowing that, man, you are in a heavenly city, the heavenly Jerusalem, not the physical one. I'm not talking about going to pilgrimage. Huh? I'll share with them over the way I was talking to them in Bonnie Island. 
Now some of you think Jesus is going to come same Jerusalem. When he goes to Jerusalem, so many of you will never see him until you die because we don't have money to buy tickets. You, can you walk to Jerusalem? You know that so many of us can't be able to make the trip. That's why I said I'm going to distribute my body into everybody. You don't need to come here. I'm coming to you. So he came to you in the spirit. But yet you are still trying to go there. He's not in Jerusalem. He's where you are. Praise the Lord. So you have received the spirit of sonship, the spirit of adoption. I, I want to show you just a few things so that we can, we can quote, quit for today. Praise the Lord. But I wish you can follow what I'm saying. I wish you can understand what I'm trying to say. Hmm? One, of the, one of the wonderful spirit about Reuben is that he's a very affectionate and compassionate person. One of the things that takes him to the city is compassion and affection. I'll show you that from the Bible. Genesis 37. Look at verse number 15. Praise God. And a certain man found him. Now, they was Joseph. Remember the story? He was taking food, looking for his brothers. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? Look at the next thing. And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hands, for I heard them say, let us go to Dalton. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dalton. One minute. Keep your place here, but let me say something. In this life, you need one man at a point in time. No matter the commission God has given to you. Is that alright? You need somebody. And these people sometimes, they may not be the kind of people you are expecting. But they may know where your resources are. Is that okay? Did you understand what I've just said? Joseph was going on a mission. He doesn't know where to go. But this man have to tell him exactly where to go. How many of you remember the story of David? When he went to war, came back, they destroyed the city, took up his wives. And children, maybe, and everybody wanted to kill David. And the Bible said David encouraged himself. I will say, okay, let me go, push you and overtake. God told him, go, push you and overtake, and recover all. Did you know that? But here David was going, he didn't know where to go to recover all. He met a slave Egyptian boy that was sick to death. And the man said, if you can give me food, don't kill me. I will show you where your wives are. It will take a slave man. To show you where God treasures are. That's why you don't despise anybody. Anyway, that's not what I'm looking for. So, what's the next verse? Verse 19. Okay, verse 18. And when they saw him, one minute. When they saw him after of, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. They wanted to kill Joseph. Is that okay? Okay, what's the next verse? And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast have devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Men are just jealous of your success. Men are just jealous of the dream God has given to you. But it's not going to work. Praise the Lord. It doesn't matter. Sometimes people tell you, Don't tell everybody your dream. Okay, I agree. This one is not everybody. This one is his own brothers. It's not everybody. Was it everybody? No. It was supposed to be a family affair. <laughs> Praise the living God. Only God can save you. Because even that which you think to be your own mother or father can betray you in the natural. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's move on now. Verse 22. Okay. And Reuben had, no one minute, 21 first. And Reuben heard it. What did he hear? He heard that he said we should kill him. And he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. Did you get that? 
was in his verse. And Reuben said unto them, Share no blood, but cast him into the pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. Affection, compassion. One of the major ways by which you enter the city through the spirit of Reuben is that you are going to possess what? Compassion. How do you see those around you? How do you feel about those who are suffering around you? I'm talking of the gates of Reuben. Hallelujah. Are you with me? How do you see them? Those who are suffering around you, those who are pains around you, how do you see them? What about those that are actually people maybe are thinking of doing some harm to? How do you, what's your response to them? Hmm? Affection, compassion. The major characteristics of the gate of Reuben. Praise the living God. Are you there with me? Amen? I want you to follow it because it's going to help you to come into the city. You see what Jesus said? The meek shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive what? Mercy. Have you read that in the Bible? That is true sonship. If you take time to read the whole of Matthew chapter 5 through 7, then you'll be able to understand the very characteristics and the laws of the kingdom of God as his son. Blessed are the merciful for they receive mercy. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. It is not the proud people. It is not the strongest people. No, 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 no. Who are those who inherit? The meek people. What spirit do you carry? How, how gentle are you? Praise the Lord. You know, you know what the Bible said? Moses was the meekest man upon the face of the earth. Huh? Do you know why he said that? And sometimes, you know, <laughs> oh man, David is a man that God loved. Who wrote that? David wrote that. Moses, the meekest man on the face of the earth. Who wrote that? Moses said that. Come on, I don't know if you understand what I'm talking about. They were only describing what God said about them. They said it. Hmm? What made Moses the meekest man on the face of the earth? Israel have sinned. God wanted to destroy them. And Moses said, no, 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 no. If you destroy them, blot my name out of the book that you have written. And God said, okay, for your sake. What he told him, let me destroy them. I'll raise up another community for you to lead. He said, no, I'm going to die with these people. Compassion, forgiveness, meekness. So Moses writes, he said, Moses is the meekest man. On the face of the earth. Why? He had compassion on those that needed what? Compassion. He identified with the weakness of Israel. Who are you? Think about it. This is Reuben saying, no, no, no. We can kill this man. Everybody hated him. Everybody jealous of his dream. He said, no, but I'm going to side with him. And he used wisdom and used tricks and told him, no, we don't need to do that. Let us, let us put him in the pit. He had a conviction. I'm sure he came back to watch if this guy was still alive. Praise the Lord. How do you relate to the church? How do you relate to the body? Joseph was the type of Jesus. Just like they hated Jesus, even so they hated Joseph. Praise the Lord. But there are people that see identify with those that they hate. Come with me to Genesis 42. Let me show you another characteristic of this man. Verse 37. Genesis 42, 37. The gate of Reuben. Compassion. <laughs> 42, 35. 35. Let's start with 35. And it came to pass as they emptied their sack. Remember where they came from? Egypt. And they wanted to go back. And Joseph said, come with Benjamin. All right. That behold, every man's bundle of money, when they came by the first time, was in his sack. And when both their, their fathers saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. Joseph put money in their sack when they were coming back. Next verse says, verse 36. And Jacob, their father, said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simon is not, and if we take Benjamin away, all these things are against me. Look at the next thing. And Reuben, the gate of Reuben, spoke unto his father, saying, 
Slay my two sons. If I bring him not to thee, deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. In other words, he could, he could give out himself and his two children on behalf of Israel just for them to survive. Because remember, they were going back to buy food. There was famine in the land. Is that okay? So Jacob was sending them now to go buy food. And this guy said, I wanted Benjamin to come with you. Don't come alone. And the people said, and his father said, no, Joseph, it's like Joseph is dead, Simon is dead, now you want to take Benjamin again? Everything is about me, it's against me. I can't allow that. Reuben stood up and said, don't worry. Give him to me. We're going to go. All for the sake of this house. If I can't bring him back, kill my two children in place of Benjamin. I mean, have you been able to come to... This is ransom. This is like paying a price with his own life. Have you come to that place in your life where you can, for the sake of somebody, make specific sacrifices? And I'll call these dangerous sacrifices. Praise the Lord. Is anybody following what I'm saying here? Kill my two children if he will not come back. Why is he saying all that? Just for the father to allow them to go because the condition was if Benjamin will not come with them, they should not come. That means if they don't come, the whole of the family will do what? We suffer and die. Praise the Lord. Compassion. The gates of Reuben. Are you following me? You want to enter these gates? Understand one thing. You are a son and a firstborn son for that matter. Get it right? Number two, affection and compassion. On the weak, on the bereaved, on those who don't have or what you can do to assist. This is the gate of Reuben. And I pray today that God will give you understanding. Can you please stand up? I want you to begin to meditate on this.